Welcome everyone to the uh, Alice Connor Gorlin Memorial Lecture. I'm trying to remember which one this is. I think it's somewhere around 12 or 13. 13. That's a lucky number. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm John Gardner. I'm the Dean of the School of Business. Um, and we welcome and appreciate your attendance at this lecture. I'd just like to, uh, I'm only here to extend my appreciation to a few people. Uh, I'd like to recognize President Russi. Gary Russi is here joining us, uh, us for this lecture today. I'd also like to uh, recognize the Student Affairs for their financial support of the Gorlin Lecture. The Economic Student Association, who helped usher everyone in here tonight, there today. This is the first time it hasn't been at night, has it? Sally Galloway. Sally here, she's uh, the Secretary and Department who organizes things, and then the Gorlin Committee of David Doan and Kevin Murphy, who, is, who put, this, uh, put this together and was able to uh, convince our speaker to come talk to us today. So I'd like to have the Department Chair of Economics, Professor Addington Copen, come up and introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Gardner. I'd like to thank David Doan and the Gordon Lecture Committee for organizing today's event. Thanks also to our student helpers. Dean Gardner, colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you a little about Professor Alice Gorlin in whose honor this lecture series is named. Dr. Alice Connor Gorlin earned a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, where she studied under Professor Morris Bornstein. She was a professor of economics in the School of Business Administration at Oakland University during the 70s and 80s. Alice also held the distinction of being the first female faculty member in the School of Business Administration. Indeed, she was among the pioneers who helped build the School of Business Administration into what it is today. Professor Gordon made her mark at Oakland University in a variety of dimensions. She was a noted scholar in the area of Soviet studies, what might be called pre-transition economics. She was a generous faculty mentor and a gifted teacher. In her time at Oakland, Professor Gordon helped influence and mold many students who have gone on to successful careers. Her scholarly work influenced and continues to influence the field of comparative economics, and her legacy lives on in this lecture series. The mission of the Alice Gordon Lecture Series is to promote understanding of international issues and events which seem more vital at this point in history than ever before. We feel quite privileged to be able to carry on with this work in Alice's name. I would now like to introduce you to our 2004 Gordon Lecturer. He is Dr. Jan Zvenar. Dr. Zvenar holds the Everett Berg Professorship in the University of Michigan Business School. He is also executive director of the William Davidson Institute at the U of M. The Davidson Institute is dedicated to developing and disseminating expertise on issues affecting transition economies with the overarching objective of improving social welfare in these countries. Dr. Zvenar earned his PhD in economics from Princeton University in 1979. Before coming to the University of Michigan, he held faculty positions at Cornell University and at the University of Pittsburgh. During his distinguished career, Jan Zvenar has been a prolific contributor to the literature in comparative studies and international economics. His work has appeared in the most important journals in our profession, including the American Economic Review, Econometrica, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and the Journal of Economic Perspectives. He has written and edited a number of books and monographs, including the Czech Republic, and economic transition in Eastern Europe. He has won numerous research grants from organizations that include the National Science Foundation, the World Bank, and the National Council for East European and Eurasian Research. Professor Zvenar was also one of the chief architects of the economic reforms adopted by the Czech Republic in the early 1990s. He has served as economic consultant to more than 20 countries, including Russia, China, the former Yugoslavia, Brazil, and Chile. His contributions in the realm of real-world policymaking continue through his work as a executive director of the Davidson Institute. Dr. Zvenar will address us today on the performance of and the challenges faced by the transition economies of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. It is our great honor to bring him to the Oakland University community 
so that the light of international understanding lit by Alice Gorlin so many years ago may continue to shine here today. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming to Oakland University, Dr. Jan Zwener of the University of Michigan. Thank you very much for uh, a wonderful introduction. I'd like to thank you all for uh, uh, joining me here today. It didn't take much persuading uh, when I was asked to come. It's a real pleasure to be here. I think it's a wonderful idea to have a, a lecture commemorating a, an important colleague, and especially important for us also because uh, she, of course, got her degree at the University of Michigan. Uh, so this is a wonderful uh, occasion. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be able to speak to you and hopefully exchange ideas. I hope we'll go into questions and answers uh, right after I make my uh, presentation about a uh, part of the world which I think is uh, one of the most exciting areas to look at, to study, to learn about, and to contribute to. Uh, the transition economies, as they're called, or the economies that were formerly centrally planned, uh, run under the communist rubric, uh, a good way to think about it is uh, here you have one-third of the world's population that uh, for almost a century or half a century, depending on where, uh, which country we're talking about, uh, decided to, not decided, but was subjected in a sort of uh, controlled experiment to uh, go through a totally different evolution, one that, of course, many people who went through it, myself included, for part of my life, uh, didn't appreciate particularly. But uh, from a scientific point of view, it was an incredible experiment, an incredible human social experiment. And we're now at the stage where these countries are trying to go back and join, if you want, the uh, uh, rest of the world. And in doing so, given that they ac account for one third of the population, they contribute in a tremendous way to the globalization that we're experiencing and have been experiencing over the last uh, decade, decade and a half, uh, and even more. So there are, of course, a number of important reasons for globalization, but this is one of them, a very important one, that many people often overlook. I mean, we realize it implicitly when we talk about China or Russia or Central Eastern Europe. So what I thought I would do today is to present to you, in a hopefully a provocative way, uh, a number of uh, pieces of information, insights, and uh, ideas, and then we can uh, have a discussion uh, about it. So a good way... Uh, I think to start is to say what makes these countries be different from other countries in the world. And I have put them here, you see them in the bottom uh, panel, Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So if you want the entire former Soviet bloc, I will uh, deal with China, uh, but in a more separate way, you, you will see. Um, so as you can see, the one thing which I think is very distinguishing compared to other countries at a similar level of uh, income per capita is that the people in these countries are very, very highly educated. Uh, I've taken here the illiteracy rate or the literacy rate, if you want. But if you look at the number of people with secondary education and so on, you know, you'll find a similar picture. And for those of you who've traveled through that part of the world, you feel that they are often equally educated, if not better educated than we are here in this country. They're usually better at math and various other things. So obviously, this is going to be very important in understanding what they have been going through and uh, where they are heading. And uh, what's um, important, you know, while we are at it, of course, is to see that, uh, you know, they are moving, moving ahead. Literacy is almost non-existent in uh, that part of the world. And I should point out, uh, this comprises very diverse countries. Within this uh, classification, we have countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, together with Central Asian republics, and, and so on and so forth. Um, just to give you a sense of what's happened, and this was to a large extent unexpected, was the deep decline that accompanied uh, the first period, uh, which uh, was anywhere from two to three years in the more successful countries and lasted uh, for most of the decade in countries such as Russia, Ukraine, countries further east. And that was a huge decline in economic activity. We don't have perfect data. So these are more kind of indicators of uh, tendencies but as such, they are not too bad. Basically, there was a major decline. We could argue about how deep it was. And then, for most countries, but not for all countries, a fairly uniform rate of increase over time. 
And the question still unresolved is why these countries went through such a deep uh, decline. After all, they were getting rid of an inferior system, adopting a superior system of economic management of uh, the economies and uh, individual units such as firms. And so why do you have uh, depressions on the order of the Great Depression of the 1930s in the process? Now, obviously, there will be some costs of adjustment, so you cannot do things uh, flawlessly and immediately. But nevertheless, it's fair to say it caught most of us uh, who were observers, uh, policymakers at the time, analysts, uh, by surprise. Mm -hmm. So when you take the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989, as the starting point, as the zero point here, and say, how have the countries done in terms of growth of GDP? Uh, as you can see, I put in the OECD countries, the rich, uh, richer countries of the world as a yardstick. The EU is the European Union, to which the uh, more Western countries of the transition world are aspiring to join and will be joining on the 1st of May. Uh, as you can see, basically, the countries are roughly where they were starting in the relative position. So 15 years later, uh, rather than having caught up, which was the expectation on the part of many people, uh, they are, by these criteria, you know, essentially where they were. They've recovered the lost ground, but uh, it's a long way to go. And so, in part, our discussion today will be in what respects have they advanced, in what respects they have a long way to go, and uh, what's the challenge here. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, if you'd like to ask questions during the lecture, that's fine with me. So, whatever, and you can either save it for later or feel free to ask points of clarification. So just to sort of indicate some other salient features here, Russia represents here the countries further east, the most important country of the former Soviet Union. If we had Ukraine here on the graph, it would be even lower and recovering even later than Russia uh, makes the graph difficult. So I haven't done it, but just so that you understand the gravity of the, of the situation here. And then you have uh, an interesting point. Look at the Czech Republic in the middle, the westernmost country that many people would have expected to do uh, the best of all. And it looked fairly promising. And then it went into a slowdown in the second half of the 1990s. And it's at the bottom tail of the more advanced part of uh, this world. So that's a country that challenges the common wisdom that geography does it all, that the more west you are, the better you will do. This is the westernmost country. In general, that wisdom is true in the sense that countries further west as a whole have done better than countries further east, but it is not uniform. Policy matters, geography alone will not do it. Distance from Brussels is not, is not everything, as they say here. Okay? So um, this is just to give you a sense more broadly. Uh, here you have the OECD and United Kingdom relative to the advanced economies. The last decade was the U.S. decade. There is no question about it. In terms of GDP growth, we've done much better than the rest of the world. And some of the large countries, such as France, Germany, and Japan in particular, have not done all that well. So this gives you a sense of where these countries fit uh, more broadly than in the first, uh, first picture. Uh, I'd like to point out something that is, again, obvious to many of us at some level, but if you compare the two giants, Russia, which was the larger economy, and China, which was the smaller economy, that's no longer the case. Uh, this gives you sort of the picture over the last uh, decade, uh, decade and a half. China had that kind of rate of growth already the preceding decade, so there are major changes going on in the world in terms of relative magnitudes uh, of uh, the different uh, economies. Um, when you look at the growth in GDP per capita, again, in a broader sense, uh, you have that first uh, diagram that I showed you now juxtaposed against how the rest of the world did more broadly in the last decade, uh, a little bit over the decade. And obviously, the growth in East Asia, Pacific, uh, was tremendous, and China is accounting for much of it. India, another rising giant, accounting for much of what we see in uh, South Asia and Central Europe uh, and um, um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia doing the worst in a way. But again, this is now combining both the decline and some of the, some of the increase and the diversity across, across the countries. And obviously, the big challenge is Sub-Saharan Africa for a number, number of reasons. But again, showing you that um, uh, many countries have not grown as fast as they were hoping, in particular Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa uh, in general. Um, moving now into the transition economies, and I have them organized in most of these uh, uh, 
tables in the sense that you see the ones that are entering the European Union or are generally located in the central uh, Europe. Not all of them are entering. Croatia is not, but the others are. Then the Baltic countries, uh, and then uh, examples from the Balkans, Bulgaria, Romania, and uh, Russia and Ukraine further east. This uh, table is important in the sense that it shows you that these countries have gone through a very dramatic period of very high and sometimes hyperinflationary period. So that the transition for them has been tough in many respects, the economic aspect, but uh, also the social fabric has been torn very badly in terms of the hyperinflation. People didn't know how to protect themselves, so uh, it eliminated the middle class in many of these countries and made it much harder uh, to proceed. Uh, the remarkable thing is that by the end of the 1990s, early part of this decade, in most countries, there are exceptions, but in most countries, inflation has been brought under control. Uh, and uh, in doing so, that's been quite remarkable. I would say this is one of the most successful aspects of the transition is that the stabilization proved to be relatively successful. Some countries had to take a uh, double go at it, Bulgaria being a good example where uh, inflation reappeared and they had to take bigger stabilization measures in the second half of the 1990s. But, but generally, this was a successful aspect of the development. And it's an important one in that if these countries want to join the European Union, as some of them are doing, they need to bring a number of criteria, inflation being one of them, close to the level that we observe in the advanced Western European economies. So on this one, they are progressing relatively well. Uh, the government budget balance has been um, also an issue. How do you bring together the revenues and the uh, uh, expenditures that you have? These countries switch from being essentially completely government run. So government budget was the entire economy to moving into a more market-like framework where we want the government to play a role, but it's a very different role from what it was used to doing. So this was actually a major challenge. It wasn't just sort of reducing, it was restructuring the government in a major way. And as part of it, as you can see during various times in different countries' uh, recent history, they had challenging moments. The uh, remarkable and in some sense sad situation that we see here is that by the late 1990s, if you look around 98, 96 or so to 2000, it looked like they were all bringing their budget deficits or many of them bring the budget deficits under control. And then suddenly by 2002, 2003, we see a number of them uh, exploding and reaching very severe and sizable budgetary deficits. And this is a big challenge right now, especially for the countries that are about to enter the European Union. They are way above what has been called the Maastricht criteria, criteria agreed upon by the European Union countries in the city of Maastricht in the Netherlands, namely that they should not have a budget deficit of more than 3% of their gross domestic product. I should mention a number of Western European countries, Germany, France, Italy being among them, have trouble with keeping, sticking to the 3% uh, level on their own. But obviously, a number of these countries are way above. And being democracies as they are now, it's tough to cut down budget deficit, especially uh, during the electoral cycle. So this is one of the big challenges, and we can talk about it uh, a little bit more. Um, the countries also had their ups and downs in the current account balance. They are all very open economies now. There is significant flow of uh, goods, services uh, across these countries. So this is just to show you that uh, this is also an important dimension that uh, many of them have to be worrying about, and especially as the more advanced ones are thinking of joining the euro, the common currency of the European Union, uh, they have to be careful. Uh, external debt, very interesting development. Some of these countries started highly indebted. If you look at Poland and Hungary, very high levels of debt. Their communist regimes uh, were very much Western-oriented in a number of directions, and one of them was they were willing to, to borrow. And so they launched their transitions with high level of indebtedness. Others, uh, Romania being probably the best example, ruled by Ceausescu, who was a very dictatorial introverted communist, basically was uh, so sealed from the rest of the world, it didn't have much of a debt at all. Czechoslovakia was another one, Slovenia, another country. You look from 1990 to, to the present, and as you can see, time is a great equalizer in this dimension. Those that were, uh, didn't have much debt accumulated, uh, or average, much more debt, 
and those that were heavily indebted, such as Hungary and Poland, either kept the level or even went down uh, some. Uh, Poland being a very good example of how to learn how to play the game. Poland actually uh, renegotiated its debt, which means it reneged, and got away with it. Okay? And uh, Hungary, on the other hand, has allocated every year to 3% of its GDP just to service the debt. And uh, as you can see, they still have it. So there are certain lessons which we don't like to think are, are there, but this, this being one of them, that there are different ways to handling your debt. Uh, the overall lesson is that by now, these countries are not all that different in terms of the debt burden they have. It's still a fairly moderate burden relative to some advanced economies, but it's nowhere uh, trivial. Uh, the most remarkable change in the economic realm is the change in ownership. This picture gives you a stylized way. If we actually went a uh, couple years earlier, I should change it and go back and have the 1990 there. Or in 89 or 1990, in a number of these economies, the private sector was either zero, 5%, maximum was uh, on the order of 20% in Hungary and Poland. Those were the economies that in some sense were already experimenting with reforms and uh, permitted some private property. Poland, for instance, always permitted private agriculture throughout the communist era. But um, so starting from nearly zero, as you can see by the mid-1990s, these economies are majority private uh, enterprise, private sector owned, and by uh, at present they are not far from most uh, market uh, economies in terms of ownership. Now, the transfer was dramatic. We have stories uh, which range from successful stories to apocryphal stories of what can happen in terms of embezzlement, looting, and uh, uh, siphoning off property during this process. Uh, nevertheless, however imperfect, these economies are now market economies based primarily on private property, private enterprise. And, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how, it, uh, how, it how they function in this respect. But uh, there, is basic, there are basically three, if you want, major uh, sectors in terms of production within it. There will be the existing state-owned enterprises that were privatized. There are newly created firms. And then there are foreign-owned, fully or partially foreign-owned firms. On average, generalizing across uh, a number of countries and sectors, what we can see is that the foreign-owned firms are very important engines of growth where they are. They are productive, and they are establishing essentially state-of-the-art production techniques. You have very dynamic, newly created sector of firms. And on average, the privatized firms are not doing as well as one was hoping. There are some that are doing quite well. But uh, on average, I think one is fair to say that that was a disappointing experience, that one expected much more uh, from privatization than, than what happened. Now, some of the privatization was privatization to the foreign owners, so that I set aside as a different category. Uh, the countries were quickly established as investor category. They got investor rating, and as you can see, they moved up in general and became uh, quite serious, uh, reaching sort of the bottom, the most advanced ones reaching the bottom levels of what you observe in the European Union, you know, Greece, or Portugal. Okay. So quite important. Look at Russia, which, as you know, in the 1998 uh, crisis, uh, Russia reneged on sovereign debt, government debt. The Russian government said, we're not paying uh, what we owe you. So uh, Russia moved into selective default. But again, it's not forever. You would sort of imagine that once you get into that level, you'll be forbidden from participating in uh, world financial markets forever and ever, or at least a long time. Well, the long time was about a year, two years, and they are right back, as you can see. And in fact, uh, investment in Russia is now uh, a favorite pastime of, of many, many investors. So uh, uh, with this globalization and rapid change that we observe in the world, uh, things are changing also in terms of what happens to countries. You know, one year they look pretty good, next year they are in selective default and they bounce back uh, and can uh, participate in the world uh, trade and uh, capital, capital movement. Uh, in terms of what's happening then on the productive side, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's happening in investment. And again, let's take a broader perspective. 
Uh, as you can see, the East Asia Pacific countries, China being the uh, driving force there in particular, have very high rates of investment. And the communist economies, the central planned economies, were like that as well. They were used to every year to plow back 35%, 40% of what they produced in order to generate uh, new productive capacity. The problem was that they were not very uh, efficient in doing it. That's why there was the demise of that, of that sector. As you can see, they still are among the ones that invest relatively heavily. The Central Europe, Asia, and uh, uh, Central Asian countries are the second most, the panel that's the second highest here in terms of investment. I put in dark blue there the amount uh, that's accounted for by foreign, uh, foreign direct investment, contribution to capital formation. And as you can see, that varies across. It is important, but it's not the bulk. Okay? So we cannot always hope that foreign direct investment is going to save everything, though it more narrowly conceived, uh, more narrowly gauged uh, uh, aspects it may. There are countries, there are sectors uh, that where foreign direct investment can make a lot of difference. And if you look here, this is now taking particular regions uh, and uh, showing you what difference it makes. You can see that within uh, the Asian area, China is very important, and India is not, for instance. Okay? We have a sense that they both have lots of things in common, somehow being more and more important. Uh, China is obviously attracting quite a lot relative to India with similar size uh, populations. Um, and as you can see, Central and East European region, the CEE region, which is uh, the more advanced economies within the uh, uh, Russian CIS, Commonwealth of Independent States, um, those are attracting most of the capital. And if you look at the last uh, five years, which is the next picture, same picture, but uh, now more recent, you will see that the share of Central and Eastern Europe, the CEE, actually goes up. Okay? So there is now major concentration of investment in that part of the world, and China and Brazil getting a share, large share within their respective regions. So if you look at the foreign direct investment, here I'm showing you the net inflows um, per capita. And just like with the GDP figures here, I also want to have a disclaimer right away. Different institutions, different uh, companies measure foreign direct investment differently. So. Uh, these figures, again, take them more as orders of magnitude than this is the absolute uh, truth. But what is important, as you can see, is that in the, the transition economies, the ones, uh, especially those further up, the first two categories among those that are now entering the European Union, uh, first, there was just a couple of them, Hungary being a good example, and Estonia, that were receiving significant inflows of foreign direct investment. But from the late 1990s on, this is the area that's receiving a huge amount of inflow of foreign direct investment. I've intentionally done it here on a per capita basis, giving you kind of an average, if you want, amount that a worker in those countries gets to work with. Right? And obviously, if workers work with modern technology, modern capital, they'll be more productive. We already talked about the fact that they are very highly educated. So you're combining high level of human capital with modern physical and financial capital. Right? And so this region is now getting quite a lot. Compare it with China, which, as we saw, has major inflows. On a per capita basis, China is getting roughly 40, uh, compared to anywhere from uh, several hundred to almost 1,000 in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, so this is something to, to bear in mind. And the other thing is that this foreign direct investment is very diverse in terms of where it goes and the origin. It's not just neighboring countries such as Germany or Austria investing there. There is a lot of American capital. There is uh, Japanese capital, which is uh, usually very cautious in terms of uh, going to faraway places. So the fact that they are willing to invest in a major way, Koreans and so on, indicates that this area is now seen as the sort of next uh, concentrated workshop of the world automobile industry being very highly represented, but uh, it's quite, quite broad across uh, different sectors. So the question here, I think the challenge is, will these countries manage to maintain the inflow of investment at the rates at which they have done it in the last uh, five, eight, ten years, depending on the country? And in particular, will they be able to kind of move from um, investment, which has been significantly into 
manufacturing, assembly, automobile, car assembly, and so on and so forth, to high value added, where they will use their engineers rather than workers and technicians, and you know, generally be able to bring up their incomes by uh, increasing productivity dramatically. So I think that's uh, another challenge to take up in our discussion, if you want. Here you get the same picture in total amounts. So that again shows you it is a relatively small part of the world. So China getting 50 uh, uh, billion uh, compared to say 5 billion in the Czech Republic or, or Poland, you know, the absolute amounts are different, but the scales of the countries in terms of populations are, are quite different uh, okay. as well. Another perspective, sort of broader perspective, I'd like to bring into our uh, consideration here is what's happened in the world as a whole in terms of public and private capital over time. Until the early 1990s, we were used to foreign aid, which would be the official capital flows, as being the important part. You know, USAID, World Bank, UN, you name it, uh, individual governments uh, contributing to world development. Well, that picture changed dramatically with globalization in the 1990s, and private capital flows became much more important, orders of magnitude more important than public flows. Uh, that, of course, was mitigated uh, once the bubble burst and uh, we went into a slowdown over the last several years. Nevertheless, as you can see, it always stayed in the relative uh, rank that private flows were more important, and it looks like they are becoming, beginning to be, again, increasingly more important, especially as governments have a hard time in terms of their budgets to find enough money for foreign assistance. So I'd like to pose it as a challenge that uh, for us, in general, worldwide, if you want, thinking of uh, development and improving conditions, that bringing together and leveraging and creating synergies between the public and private sectors and their capital, capital flows is really where the action is and where the thinking should be. Uh, and mentioning uh, the Davidson Institute, that's in part what we've been doing, is trying to bring together the know-how and the private and public capital in the work that we do around the world. Uh, we, for instance, send um, something like 200 students, MBA students, who go and work in companies or institutions all over the world every year, and we use both public and private funds in order to accomplish that. And they work both in the private, public, NGO sectors precisely to have the highest, highest impact. So at a small scale, this is what we're doing. Um, give you some sense of where these countries are in important, other important dimensions, such as the information and communications technology. Um, obviously, the high-income countries are way ahead of everybody else, but a number of these other uh, parts of the world and Central Eastern Europe, uh, Central Asia in particular, are obviously making strides. Uh, if when you look at it, for instance, this number of telephones uh, per uh, thousand people. Um, personal computers, the advanced countries are much further ahead uh, than the other economies. Again, the tendency is encouraging in the sense that it's changing and improving, but it's not a catch up in the sense of uh, getting to the same, same level. So just like with the GDP, you know, they are not catching up, uh, not closing the gap or not very fast. Uh, uh, in these other indicators, uh, you know, there is a way, way to go as well. And by the time you look at the internet users, uh, that uh, picture is even, even more dismal. Now again, there there's compositional fallacies here in the sense that uh, you have uh, very successful use, collective use of internet in a number of places in the developing countries. So um, that uh, compensates for this. But nevertheless, I think that it's clear that the challenge is how to bring these economies, and including here the Central and East European economies, more to the fold in terms of being in the same technological realm as uh, the more advanced uh, countries. Um, this is, sorry, I'm jumping back here. Uh, let me now turn to still economic but uh, more socially oriented indicators so we get a sense of uh, what's going on. And unemployment rate is a very good one for a number of reasons. Uh, um, a, it shows us uh, how much of an important resource is not being productively used, right? and economists in general and policymakers in particular are very concerned and should be concerned about keeping idle uh, important part of the economic resources that we have. 
Second, it has important social, psychological, and other ramifications, obviously, uh, and political ramifications. Um, and in the transition economies, this is true even more so than in other parts of the world. And the reason is the following. Um, unemployment was basically an unknown phenomenon. The one thing that the regime succeeded in doing, the communist regime, was eliminating open unemployment. You could argue that uh, unemployment was there, it was just disguised. A lot of people had low marginal productivity or zero marginal product, uh, you know, leaning against shovels and not contributing too much uh, in the vivid images that people have. But, uh, but they didn't suffer the stigma, the scarring, the problem of loss of skills that people who do not work at all basically, basically suffer from. And so that changed dramatically. And with the exception, as you can see, of a few countries, Czech Republic being a remarkable exception, uh, unemployment appeared as a phenomenon and went, in terms of unemployment rate, measured by the Western standards, into double digits. Okay? Over, it's a matter of two to three years for most of these countries. Now, that was a shock that's hard to imagine if you had not gone through it for people that were not used to it, and suddenly uh, it happened. Okay? And the difference between the Czech Republic and the other economies is dramatic in terms of the level of the rate, and we studied it a lot and used it for policy purposes because there was also an important structural difference. The Czech Republic people were getting unemployed, like in the other economies, but they were quickly getting out of unemployment and into more productive jobs. So in a way, that was important. It's exactly what you would want when you think about it for a moment. You want to move people from the mismatched, bad match, you know, low unemployment job into those areas where they can contribute more. And in the process, hopefully, they will not be idle for too long. So short spells of unemployment. That's what you saw in the Czech Republic. And it gave rise to low unemployment rate until the recession of the late 90s set in. Uh, in the other economies, you saw just the opposite. People became unemployed, and many of them stayed unemployed. So you became to have the problems of long-term unemployment, the stagnant pool, hard to get out of it. Once you get into it, it was hard to escape. Okay? Well, that had then ramifications uh, politically. The first wave of reformers that were brought in gloriously into power in all these countries got mercilessly voted out of office, and the reform communists usually were brought in because they were seen as being more sensitive to uh, the social needs of the population. And so you had you know, important uh, setbacks of what looked like setbacks in terms of the transition, in terms of the path of what happened. As it turned out, fortunately, uh, most of the governments continued the reform. So it wasn't like those who were the uh, right of center, if you want, free market uh, zealots were the only ones who would do it, and the ones who were left of center would not. It turned out that actually the transition proceeded at about the same rate. Yeah, please. Actually, it, it uh, wasn't that much. We've done a study, and actually I have a paper in the American Economic Review where we look at Czech and Slovak republics. Uh, as you can see, Slovakia had a very high unemployment rate, Czech Republic very low. They, had this, they shared the same currency. They, we could control for a lot of things, almost like a natural experiment. Yeah. And the Slovak uh, uh, labor market looks very much like the Polish labor market in the way I described it. And it turned out that actually the responsiveness, if you want, the elasticity that people had in terms of not looking for a job when they had high um, unemployment benefits, that was not so high. In other words, that was not too much, too much of a problem. I think the problem was more on the demand side, that there weren't enough uh, jobs being offered or vacancies uh, being, being created. And That's real, real unemployment. Though. Real, yeah, real unemployment. Now, some of it, uh, real, I, I, sh I should pause, there is some also that, uh, you know, we find examples, it's hard to substantiate where people are collecting unemployment benefits and they are self-employed, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't have too many of them working in sort of Citibank and collecting unemployment benefits. So usually those people who are cheating one way or another are not really getting big jobs so that uh, one would worry about uh, them sort of uh, double dipping in a, in a serious way. So nobody, so it is a, it is a you know, real, uh, question now, as you can see again, what we see now later on is that unemployment has gone down or uh, is below 10% in a number of economies, but some of the fastest growing economies that you may recall from the earlier uh, diagram, Poland being the fastest growing economy, Slovakia being fast growing, 
have unemployment rates in the high teens. You know, very, very difficult to square with the high rates of growth. And uh, so this is an open area of research if some of you are interested actually in uh, uh, contributing. This is, I think, an area where having a better understanding would be, would be very, very valuable. Uh, I should also mention that uh, you go to all the way to countries such as um, for a while Russia and Ukraine, the rate of transformation was slow enough that actually the low rates of unemployment are signifying the survival of the old system where firms have too many workers and so on and so forth rather than rapid restructuring and uh, being able to do it with low, low unemployment rates. Okay, so that's, uh, that's important. Um, income inequality. What I have done here is show you a particular indicator called the Gini coefficient which uh, very simply uh, put if it were at zero, would be perfect equality. Everybody would be getting the same income. And if it were at one or 100, here we multiply it by 100, uh, then one person or one family would be receiving all the income. So it would be the extreme inequality that one could imagine. And as you can see, these countries started, on the whole, being very egalitarian. And that was, again, another distinguishing feature of the system, of the communist system, uh, barring you know, particular instances, the nomenclatura, the uh, party elite, those were doing very well, but the rest of the population was kept in a very egalitarian uh, um, system. And what the market did, the introduction of the market forces, was to make the distribution more unequal. But an interesting story unfolded here, uh, related to our uh, discussion just a second ago. Uh, as you can see in the more Western countries, uh, the level of inequality that was created was moderate. In particular, they moved sort of from being very equal to being Scandinavian, which we think of being very equal in the uh, market type uh, economies. And, and there are essentially two processes at work here. If you just look at what the opening itself to the market and becoming a market economy did, that created very high inequality. Markets have that tendency, they create inequality. But these countries have very well developed social safety net with the unemployment benefits, with the pension systems, with the social security transfers, and that brought it back. So the Gini coefficient might jump from 20 to 40 and was brought back to the high 20s or low 30s, essentially by the social transfers. Okay. When you look at Russia, and I think that the higher figures, the increase sort of going to uh, uh, closer to 50 rather than 40 is, is the more accurate. We have two measures here depending on the data. So in Russia, you have huge uh, outburst of inequality. Russia is uh, more unequal now than countries such as India. It's not quite as unequal as Brazil, but it's heading in that direction. And you say, why it happened there? And it turns out it had the same tendency for the market forces to create the inequality. And then, for some reason, the government transfers, the social security system and everything, add it to that. It is regressive rather than progressive. So it actually ag aggravated the inequality. Uh, and Russia was essentially redistributing from the poor to the richer, paradoxic as it is. Okay? And this is the overall, overall outcome. So you encounter you know, very fascinating sort of instances of uh, policies uh, having effects which uh, sometimes are unanticipated or counterintuitive. Um, it's always good to look at some uh, Indicators that are not affected by possibility of mismeasuring prices or you know, people not reporting accurately. I mean, you know, they might not report birth rates accurately either, but let's say it's a more physical, physiological type uh, measure. And what you see in all of these economies is that birth rates have fallen quite uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, especially if you took the preceding decade and looked at it, you will see a break uh, from the past. Now, as you can see with the control countries I put here, that's a phenomenon that's uh, been happening uh, quite broadly. It's happening in Western Europe as well. Hasn't been happening to the same extent in the United States. But what is happening, definitely women have been postponing, if not foregoing, uh, having uh, children or same number of children as they used to. And that has very important implications for these countries in the sense that the population, which is already relatively old in terms of its structure, is going to be aging even more in the future. So there are some very serious long-term challenges facing uh, these countries in the future, this being one of them. Demographic challenges very often are ignored by 
politicians, policymakers, because you know you don't have to handle it from this year to next year, so why not postpone it? Uh, but it's uh, there is an iron law in them in the sense that uh, it's really difficult to uh, ignore it for for a long time. Um, in terms of life expectancy, uh, these uh, countries uh, were quite well positioned, uh, but together with Sub-Saharan Africa, they are the only region where we actually see a decline in uh, life expectancy at birth. Uh, a lot of it is um, adult, middle-aged men who've been uh, dying at rates which are much higher than, um, um, than would be expected, but it's a broader phenomenon in, in general. And as you can see, Central Eastern Europe, Central Asia, apart from Sub-Saharan Africa, is the only part of the world where we see it. And Sub-Saharan Africa, obviously, it's HIV AIDS uh, related on a massive scale. Here, as I say, it may be related to other phenomena such as stress going with the transition and so on and so forth. It's not fully understood. There are a number of studies that are being done. Um, we have some indications as to what's going on and, um, and we're trying to get, get more information. Um, this then shows you a little bit more disaggregated picture and you see what's going on. You look at countries that are in the western part uh, and, and uh, in the Baltics, and as you see, their life expectancy was continuing to increase over time, just like you see in the advanced countries. Where by the time you go to the Balkan countries, uh, it's the rate of growth slows down or essentially you have constant uh, situation over time, such as in Romania. And when you go to Russia and Ukraine, you see the decline. So the decline was primarily in the former Soviet Union, and uh, it reached its depth in the mid-1990s. It has increased slightly since then, uh, but obviously the life expectancy is much lower there. So the countries that had much greater decline of GDP per capita, as you could see in earlier on, and that uh, have uh, had more severe problems are showing it also in these, uh, in these indicators. Um, this is the uh, infant mortality rate. And as you can see, even here, the Central Eastern Europe, Europe, and Central Asia are the ones that are declining. So while we know that it's the prime age males that are you know, suffering the most from the higher mortality, it is uh, actually also has to do with uh, healthcare deterioration and so on and so forth more generally. Again, if I showed you a disaggregated picture, it would be mostly in the countries that are further east rather than more west. Um, marriage rates, huge decline as well. Okay. So people are postponing or not marrying at the same rates that they would used to. Again, there is a similar tendency in Western Europe, but it's much more pronounced in the transition economies uh, than elsewhere. Interestingly enough, uh, if you look, and I don't have uh, that table here, if you look at divorce rates, they have not gone up. So in some sense, uh, there was an effect on marriage creation, but not on marriage destruction. Asymmetric, okay? Um, so that, uh, that is sort of interesting to see what, what's happening. Let me just skip and move to what I think the uh, current issues are. Um, so where are these economies? We've got a picture of uh, the tremendous uh, tumultuous development that they've gone through, right? Change of system, change of lifestyle. It's unexpected. People did not expect this. So this is something they could not quite prepare for, right? For US uh, analysts, uh, that's very good because it's an unexpected experiment. You always worry that people expect and adjust before, and so you mismeasure things. Here, really, people were getting educated to work in a central advanced system, not to work in a market system. So you can, in a way, isolate the effects much better. And uh, they moved to the situation where they are. And um, by the early 2000s, uh, these are very open economies. Uh, the westernmost countries, 70% of GDP is exported. 70% of their consumption comes from imports. So imports plus exports you know, are 1.5 times or more of the GDP. Uh, very open economies. In other words. So they depend on what's happening in the rest of the world. And so the uh, slowdown in the US economy and the European Union's economy uh, was very dramatic for them. Most of their interaction trade is with Western Europe. So the EU slowdown, which has been longer and more pronounced than in the United States, has been particularly uh, tough for them. There are now signs of recovery, so that's very good. Um, 
there are the big internal issues such as the budget deficits that I uh, signaled to you and in part that came from the slowdown because what these countries did is uh, having their export markets slowing down, they tried to stimulate domestic consumption, domestic investment and accumulated the budget deficits that we've seen. So it's all linked together one way or another. There are now big questions about the entry into the European Union. As you know, eight of these countries, plus Malta and Cyprus, are entering on May 1st the European Union. It's going to be the largest enlargement of the European Union, where the current 15 members will increase to 25 with these 10 new entrants. Uh, the 10 new entrants uh, will add uh, close to 80 million people, so the population will go from 380 almost million to 450 plus million, so it's a large enlargement. They are much poorer in terms of uh, income per capita, but they are much faster growing uh, than the Western European countries. And the question is, how will this enlargement uh, happen? Will it be harmonious? Will it work well? Or will it be tough to swallow these new entrants? And we've already seen on the political front, there's been, there have been some tough negotiations where just uh, before the end of the year in December, uh, Poland was one of the main countries that balked at accepting the new European Union constitution that you know, there was a conventional uh, assembly, a constitutional assembly, which took a year to put together a constitution. And the Poles, together with Spaniards and some other countries, said no, it's not acceptable. Okay, it was an issue of how many votes, how much power, voting power different countries will get. And uh, the transition economies that are entering the European Union showed that they were willing to essentially stand their ground uh, for their own self-interest. They also are much more pro-American than the rest of Europe on average. And so that also creates certain tensions in terms of the transatlantic relationship where obviously there now will be a much more important emphasis on uh, having good relations with the US, which I think is very good, but internally it's going to create uh, some uh, problems of transition within the European Union. Okay? In terms of the economics of it, I uh, maintain the view that it's not going to be as bumpy and problematic as many people uh, warn and worry about. The reason is primarily what I already mentioned, that these countries are already quite integrated. They already trade mostly with the European Union. Okay, they already have quite low tariffs. So on May 1st, yes, some tariffs will go down, but uh, they've already been reduced significantly over the last decade. So this is going to be the last step of a long process whose impact we've already seen. Okay? A number of times you will see Western European commissioners and other officials come to Warsaw, Prague, Budapest, you name it, these countries, and saying, you guys are not ready. You're not competitive. This is going to be really bad for you. And you wonder why, given that these countries are importing a lot and competing with the imports and are exporting a lot and competing with the exports. And it turns out that what's often implicit behind these arguments is that somehow these countries should be raising their wages to the level of wages in the European Union, which one as consumer wouldn't mind at all one as a worker or a company that has to compete with much more advanced technology and uh, companies that worked in a market system for a long time, one would worry about. So I think that the problem would be if these countries had to, in a way, adopt levels of uh, labor cost and rules and regulations which significantly hampered their activity, economic activity, which now is not superb, but they are doing quite well given where they started and where they, uh, wh what they did. So I think that's going to be the big issue, is what's going to happen internally once these countries are within. And a good example is East Germany, former East Germany. Uh, as we know, that uh, what was supposed to be a miracle was a, uh, a real fiasco, at least at the beginning. And a lot of it was due to the fact that wages were raised essentially to West German level, not quite 80 percent, but you know, they were increased five, six, seven times uh, from the initial level. It's hard to compete if uh, your wage cost, labor cost is suddenly raised that much without uh, changing dramatically everything else, including lay laying off a lot of workers, which is what happened in East Germany. So those would be problems, but they are avoidable. Or if they happen, I think that would be a major deficiency of policy and coordination within that. 
prices of raw materials and oil are not just important for us here, as we learn from everyday experience, they are important for these countries as well. Uh, countries such as Russia are important producers, and Russia has been doing really well over the last six, seven years, in part because it's been exporting raw materials, oil, gas in particular, at prices which recently have been quite high. So Russian um, performance, I think, will depend very much on that. And right now, in the short run, it looks pretty promising. The other countries are consumers. They are not rich in natural resources, so they obviously uh, have the other side of the stick. Um, and I think that when you talk about the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is the countries of the former Soviet Union that are not entering the European Union, their performance is very much linked with Russia's uh, performance. You can see it structurally in terms of uh, trade and activities that are there. You see it empirically during the Russian crisis. Those were the countries that were very much affected negatively at the time. The countries in Central Europe were not affected almost at all because they were already oriented towards the European Union. Um, overall, I think there are two very positive factors, and that's the EU entry. I think it's a positive factor. It's going to account for faster growth for the new members. And to the extent that the world economy is recovering, then that, uh, I think, is the other major factor. And I will conclude. We have uh, a forecasting uh, group that uh, I'm involved in with some other people, and it turns out our forecasts actually, we've been checking them against other forecasters, are among the most uh, accurate ones. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uses them every year in, in their report. They publish them. So this is our crystal ball. You're here. You've seen it. Uh, so as you can see, we are forecasting that these countries will grow anywhere from sort of 3.5% for Czech Republic, Hungary on the low end to very fast rates of growth in uh, the Baltics uh, on the order of uh, 6%, 5%, 6% uh, there. And uh, we had relatively lower estimates here for Russia. We were forecasting lower uh, um, prices of oil. So to the extent that the oil prices will keep at the current level, I would say the Russian estimates will be also between 5 and uh, 5 and 6%. So that's um, you know roughly uh, twice to three times as fast as uh, the advanced economies. The U.S. economy is doing better, but uh, certainly than uh, uh, Western European countries. So these should be, at least in the foreseeable future, very vibrant, dynamic, and uh, fast-growing economies with a number of problems uh, that you can imagine stem from the uh, structural features that, uh, that I've outlined here. Uh, but I certainly recommend to you to uh, Study them if you're looking for an area of study, and if you can combine it with a visit, there are great places to visit. So if you don't have a place to go this summer, head for Prague, Budapest, and Warsaw. Thank you. <laughs> Would you like to take a question from the audience? I, I th yeah, good, very, very good question. I think Russia is, and it realizes that it is way below its potential. Okay, China is giving it an you know, incredible example, and uh, the Central East European countries that are joining the European Union and have been growing you know, quite fast after the initial decline are also. So the Russians realize it, and uh, I think that their aspirations are, are very high. Uh, their problem is that they really have not gone through the transformation anywhere near to the point uh, that's needed. And in a way, they've gone very fast. The Chinese model is one where you essentially uh, disintegrate as little as possible in terms of the law and order and the you know, legal structure. It has the disadvantage that you keep the communist system, essentially. But you do make major transformations in the economic realm. Russia went very fast arguably couldn't have done otherwise because it was disintegrating. Uh, but it has not put in place really the infrastructure and the level of economic activity uh, that would be replacing the old system very, very effectively. Again, there are very good examples of, uh, from banks to industrial firms to service sector uh, doing very well. 
uh, but not on a large scale. So I think Russia really needs to continue, finish the uh, restructuring and be as open as possible. I think the fact that they are uh, willing to, to be open, that, that, is, that is very good because otherwise uh, they will not you know, move ahead very fast. That's a, it's a very, very tough, uh, tough situation because what you have on the one hand, you want to move to a market system and private property and want to be sure that your firms become more productive. And in many instances, the oligarchs are actually improving performance uh, very significantly. On the other hand, as you know from the numerous accounts, they accumulated their wealth uh, very often by means that were, you know, if not outright illegal, semi-legal. And... Uh, most people in Russia, if you talk to them, you know, will sort of consider that to be illegitimate. So how can you operate in an illegitimate system and at the same time be achieving uh, the goals that you're trying to achieve? Uh, I, think, I think that they are trying, they're gonna, gonna muddle through, they're probably going to uh, actually bring few of the oligarchs to justice one way or another, Khodorkovsky, Lebedev, and so on. But I, I don't think that they will renationalize and start completely from scratch. I think that it would be just such a shock to the to the system that not even Putin is going to contemplate it. Yeah. Uh, how important is it how willing we are to open for countries like this that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I'm thinking about outsourcing and transferring the news. Right. Who wins yeah. and who loses when we do? In outsourcing. Yeah. I think I think that Judging from the past experience of the United States, we've done the equivalent of outsourcing, free trade, outsourcing in the past and so on. We've always been able to create new opportunities. So that was in a way the ideal system where new jobs were created on average, better paying and so on. That's why the wealth in the United States and incomes have risen. There's been inequality associated with it as well. So that, that's very important. I think the big issue nowadays is whether because of globalization and the technical progress that we see and new countries emerging with new capabilities, whether the rate is such that we will not be able to keep creating jobs at the same rate to replace them. So it's a beneficial phenomenon provided we can minimize the cost of adjustment. And in the past, we've been able to minimize the cost to the point that basically it was socially acceptable. You know, it was tough, Michigan being a good example, you know, how tough it was, you know, with the adjustment and so on. But it, you know, didn't rock the boat completely, and after all, when you look back, you say, well, it's great, we are all more efficient, better off, etc." So I think we have the same thing here. If it can be done, everybody will be better off. The question is, will the um, adjustment, the cost of adjustment be so high that in some sense it'll destroy, uh, again, the social political fabric or read re to uh, retaliation. I mean, by the way, these countries, you know, are the worst we can do for them is by closing up. Uh, I've um, talked to a number of people in various countries um, when the Millennium Challenge account was being set up. The U.S. says it was doubling um, the amount of foreign assistance and so on. And we held a number of roundtables through the Davidson Institute around the world talking to people and getting their feedback. And very often they were saying, look, this is peanuts. It's not so important to us. The farm bill is the problem. The steel uh, tariffs are the problem. You're closing your markets, okay? We don't need handouts, we just want to have access. And I think that's really the way, you know, philosophically we've always been, and philosophically I think we should try to, to maintain that. Mm -hmm. They are planning to join the Euro, uh, so the countries that are now joining the European Union in May uh, are all planning to join the Euro later this decade, between 2008 and 2010. Um, I think that it all depends uh, how they join. Uh, I think that in many respects institutionally and so on, they are ready, the central banks are functioning just like central banks everywhere else, there is capital movement, they open their capital accounts and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, they will lose the monetary policy as their tool. Fiscal policy will be essentially the one tool that will be left to them. 
Uh, I think they are willing and interested in going for it because they feel that the increase in transparency, willingness of investors to come in, if there is no exchange rate risk and so on, is worth it. Uh, my sense is yes, it is. And in fact, I, in one direction, I would say they should be even ready to enter faster should major external destabilization took place because these are small countries and they have to keep their currency relatively stable vis-a-vis -vis the euro as a condition of entering for two years they'll have to stay in a narrow corridor uh, so the polish zloty relative to euro czech crown relative to euro and so on uh, that is supposed to test whether they are internally ready to maintain that stability but it forgets this is a bureaucratic sort of condition imposed from Brussels, but it forgets completely that external speculators can destabilize the currency dramatically. Just remember George Soros and his uh, group in 1992 destabilized the British pound, much larger economy. The British Central Bank was intervening with the assistance of all the central banks from the continent, and at the end of the night they capitulated, right? So, you know, where is little Hungary or Slovakia going to be maintaining their currency in the case somebody tries to move it, right? So I think that this condition is nonsensical, but it's a good example where bureaucrats prevail over sound reason. And, uh, and so I think these countries should be ready actually to enter faster because after all, you can do it unilaterally. You can just essentially convert your reserves into euro and declare euro to be your official currency. You don't need the permission from Brussels. Now it would make people in Brussels very unhappy if you did that, but, uh, but it's doable. We have countries that unilaterally adopted other countries' currencies. Uh, but if everything goes according to plan, they're essentially going to try to converge, 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 and then uh, move, move there in the late, uh, late 2000. I think it also depends what the European Union is going to adopt as its transfer policy within the EU. Because the common argument against for going into the monetary union is that if you have different countries, it's problematic because they are asynchronous. Some are in booms and some are in busts, and you have to have single monetary policy. You cannot aim it for one versus the other, right? So you cannot help one or the other. But that assumes that they also don't help each other, right? If they help each other fiscally, so that those who are in the boom are willing to transfer resources to those who are in the recession and vice versa, then it's actually advantageous to have different countries entering the same monetary union because you're spreading the risk. You don't want all be in a recession at the same time because nobody can help anybody else, right? So that will depend what will happen. Right now, I think they're not helping each other all that much, so that's where the risk that you're pointing to is, is stemming from. Might change. Right. No, you're absolutely right, and I, I can you know, let me elaborate on that. I think you you learn a lot from from the cultures there. You learn from you know young people, your counterparts there, who are. Uh, thinking, you know, in a penetrating way about what they are doing, why things are different there than here. Uh, there are great cultural venues. I mean, yeah, when I was, uh, I spent some time in uh, Prague during the early 1990s, and there was at that time, there must have been tens of thousands of young Americans sitting and, uh, you know, drinking beer and thinking they were Franz Kafka, just like they were Marcel Proust in Paris uh, 40 years or 50 years earlier. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's terrific, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it's obviously very important and there is a, I would say that's one of the liveliest debates that's now uh, uh, being carried out among the professionals and the policymakers in these countries and 
The reason it's so lively and has this special twist to it is that these countries were essentially centrally governed, right, centrally planned, and they've moved away from it. And now these kinds of thoughts and their examination of other countries, they are realizing that Koreas, Singapore's, etc., have relied, and in not necessarily in a very transparent way, that's what makes it difficult, on government intervention or government guidance or planning, bailouts, right, and all sorts of things. And so there are now very different uh, points of view, uh, you know, the extent to which government should actually guide this, as opposed to just be an enab enabling mechanism and letting the private enterprise figure out what it is. And uh, as you can imagine, it's some, some mixture of both that you see in terms of the outcomes. Uh, in the enlightened variety, the government is putting emphasis on infrastructure, saying the private sector will then you know, do the rest. In the more heavy-handed one, people are saying, no, we should actually select the winners and have industrial policy. And so it'll be interesting actually to look at these countries over time and see which ones go in which direction. There I should just as an aside mention that they've already gone through an interesting twist. They uh, are re-regulating as they're entering the European Union. This happened to the Scandinavian countries as well and the Austrians. They sort of went through a period of deregulation, introducing more free market system. As they are entering the European Union, they have to actually re-regulate. They have to accept all sorts of uh, government interventions that they say, gee, it took us so long to get rid of, and now we are accepting it in order to be part of the uh, common, you know, one single European Union. So that's, uh, as an aside, related to that. Right. Well, I think, I think it's a beneficial thing. So I think the rest of the world should support it, and I think it is. The U.S. policy, for instance, is saying, yes, the enlargement is a good idea. Uh, the USAID worked in these countries uh, to prepare them to enter the European Union. It's uh, both from an enlightened standpoint and from self-interest. It's much easier for the U.S. businesses to deal with one tariff structure than with multiple tariffs and so on, multiple regulations. Uh, there is a little bit of a danger, of course, if things should turn sour. Uh, we could see the emergence of a polar world where you could have the European Union, you could have the Americas in some configuration and the Pacific Rim, each of which is a large enough area that they could uh, exploit the benefits of, of scale and so on. Uh, and obviously we would all be worse off, but it would be doable. So I think the, the real challenge at the global level is how do you keep the world open while these large units like the European Union are being formed. And uh, obviously the big benefit of keeping it open is that you have the foreign investment going to Ireland, now to Central Eastern Europe, and obviously uh, the mobility is uh, increasing efficiency and you know, in the end everybody, everybody's better off provided we can forestall uh, the backlash. Uh-huh, uh-huh.